please remain standing for the invocation, those who will. In hope, with joy, stepping together through beloved gates, repeating the path of Brunonians through the centuries, we greet this year. Singing loudly, albeit outside, La Shana Tova, we exclaim, quivering with anticipation. We hail the holidays and the opening of school, our return to normal, but our oft uttered new vocabulary, masking, zooming, virtual, in-person, synchronous, asynchronous, socially distanced, contact traced, asymptomatic quarantine, and more. Nuance eloquently that our contention to new normalcy may be just a bit too much. Even the sweetness of gathering again in person is extraordinary. How glibly we once presumed this, but never ordinary now, it's dear to us. May we breathe our recognition in and out, even as we hold our breath, mindful that normal will never feel or be secure. New awareness asks of us new choice. Precarity is and will be our new address. From the ancient Hebrew text, we hear Moses. He speaks before us, setting blessing and curse, life and death, and instructs us clearly, choose life. In extremity, we seek a resilient radiance, even as we confess some temerity, some exhaustion. We covet the old rhythms of dance and song, of romance, of research, of children, and schools and shared meals and classes even as safety and earthquake and flood and fire and famine are too near. Spared, we the grateful are mindful of all whom we mourn, all that's been lost, even as we lay claim to a future that is bright. May fresh hope fuel be our fuel for capacity to build new science, to hear voices long silent, to enfranchise new faces in politics, to enact new modes of cherishing amid this demanding new precarity. Please, for rescue, mimic our deep yearnings, and we ask courage and imagination, diligence, scholarship, and engagement. Vaccines prove the power of learning to create capacity. Brown's study of slavery brought injustice and wrongdoing into plain view, and with courage and acuity, we set our faces to build new models for seeing what's been missing, for hearing the silence, for new inclusivity, for strengthening a compassionate political will. Move us beyond abolition and repudiation, that we may take up the the outcry of the wronged, striving to ascend to new heights of right seeing and right doing. Join our voices to a winged, ancient, migratory call for life, flocks of new thinkers and new coalitions forming in this age and every age to seek without restraint, flight together, finding strength for the journey with one another even as the earth quakes, the waters rise, and illness threatens. Today, students, faculty, and all who lead and love this university hear our gratitude for families, for teachers, for friends, for benefactors, and heroic role models in so many fields, for all those who, make, who ask of us worthy work and rescue. These are not our life's burdens. These are our callings. These are the sweet blessings of the life that we're called to, called to discharge these offices of life with usefulness and reputation. So help us in hope 
to reply with integrity and deep compassion always. Amen. Please be seated. The 19th president of Brown University, Christina Paxson. We're here. Members of the Brown community, faculty, staff, alumni, parents, and students, it is my great pleasure as president of Brown University to declare the 258th academic year open. I extend my warmest welcome to members of the entering classes of the medical school, graduate school, and the college. Among them are 1,058 exceptionally talented doctoral and master's students, 144 dedicated medical students, we need you, 10 brilliant resumed undergraduate education students, individuals who have gained life experience between high school and their entrance to Brown. They're terrific. Ten roots, yeah. 80 very wise transfer students. And of course, the exceptional 1,710 first year students, the core of the Brown University class, the great Brown University class of 2025. It is so great to see all of you here. Now, I want to give a special shout out though to students who studied from remote, remote locations for part or even all of last year. Welcome back, we missed you. And I'm so glad that the students who couldn't march through the Van Winkle Gates this last year had the opportunity to do so today. So welcome. Now, in a few days, students will begin classes with faculty members who have done absolutely heroic work over the past year and a half during an exceptionally difficult time all the while focusing on providing the outstanding education for which Brown is known. Brown faculty are incredible. Please join me in recognizing them. And I also, I also want to express my gratitude for the amazing Brown employees from dining services, health services, res life, facilities, laboratory uh, personnel, people who work in administrative offices and more. Many of them worked on campus throughout without a hitch the past 18 months and others have returned recently or will return soon to the campus after more than a year of remote work. They have done everything possible to keep Brown moving forward in the very best way. So thank you to our employees, our staff. Now, my primary role today is to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Nuliwe Brooks, excuse me. And I'm looking forward to hearing her reflections about the first reading for this year, Brown's renowned slavery and justice report, and why, why the history of Brown's connections to the New England slave trade is as relevant today as it was when the report was written 15 years ago. But before I introduce Dr. Rooks, I want to comment on another strand of Brown's history, which continues to shape the intellectual and human culture of this university. It starts with Brown's charter, and that was written in 1764. Now, Charters, and you can find it online, they're legal documents, and like many legal documents, much of it is dry and unremarkable. It establishes the roadmap for governance of the, what we know now today as Brown University. It didn't have that name at the time. But things like how many fellows and trustees would make up the governing body, how professors and presidents would be hired, how tuition would be set, and so on. So that's the charter. 
But there's one part of the charter that is remarkable. And I'm thinking of a section that's simply titled, No Religious Tests. The following text appears in that section. And this is an excerpt. And furthermore, it is hereby enacted and declared that into this liberal and Catholic, small c Catholic institution, shall never be admitted any religious tests. But on the contrary, all the members hereof shall forever enjoy full, free, absolute, and uninterrupted liberty of conscience. And then it goes on to say, youth of all religious denominations shall receive a like, fair, generous, and equal treatment during their residence therein. Now, I know, we take it for granted today that Brown is open to people from all faiths. That's nothing exceptional now. But in 1764, the notion that an institution of higher education would not only accept students from all religions, but would openly embrace the idea of liberty of conscience, that wasn't normal. That was radical. Now, a side note on something that is especially relevant today on the eve of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. In 1770, the corporation, which is the name of the college's governing body, was asked whether this religious openness applied to Jews. And in response, the corporation passed a resolution, and it stated the following, the children of Jews may be admitted into this institution and entirely enjoy the freedom of their own religion without any constraint or imposition, whatever. So to all members of our Jewish community, let me say Shana Tova or good year. Now, at its inception, fire truck, at its inception, was Brown open to everybody? No, no, it wasn't, of course not. Black students, native students, women, and atheists were not welcome. Students who couldn't afford tuition didn't have access. But although Brown was far from perfect in numerous dimensions, that initial seed of an idea, that embrace of intellectual openness and diversity, that's grown stronger over time, and it's become a defining part of our institutional culture. Now, I've written and spoken about this piece of Brown history before, but let me explain why I think it's especially relevant today. And I speak directly to our students. You're here at what is undeniably a contentious and polarized time. Recently, and not for the first time, the work we do at universities has been swept up into the culture wars. And the media has been full of charges that universities engage in indoctrinating students into specific ways of thinking about social and political issues. If true, this would indeed be a serious concern. But this is not Brown. Since our beginning, the radical idea, radical idea of bringing people from different faiths together to learn has blossomed into a culture that celebrates open inquiry and the exploration of new ideas. We stand for learning, not indoctrination. It's core to who we are. Now, I can't promise you that at times you won't find it uncomfortable to question the status quo or to express what might be of minority view. That takes courage even in the most welcoming of environments. Even sitting around your own kitchen table with your family, you might find that out at Thanksgiving when you bring home some new ideas. Part of your education is to develop the courage of your convictions. That's part of why you're here. And at Brown, you're going to be helped by the fact that we place great value on kindness, humility, respect for the dignity of all human beings, this is also core to who we are. This is how you should expect to be treated. This is how you should treat others. Now consider, back to the charter for a minute, that it said that students of all faiths should receive, quote, like, fair, generous, and equal treatment. 
Fairness and equality, that's a given, that's core, that's standard. But generosity, generosity of spirit, that's something more. It elevates all of us to a higher level. It makes it possible for us to learn together in an atmosphere of trust and mutual respect. And when these two things are put together, these two things, open inquiry, generosity of spirit, when they're united, they create an environment that powers learning, powers personal growth for all members of our community. And that's, that's how we counter polarization and distrust. That's how we advance knowledge and understanding to the benefits of a diverse society. Now, this is a complicated time to be a university student. We are facing a pandemic that doesn't seem to want to leave, hopefully will soon, a renewed and I think long overdue reckoning with racism, climate change, cybercrime, threats to democracy, I could go on. At Brown, you're going to grapple with these issues and many others, and you're going to do so inside the classroom and outside of the classroom. And together, as a community of scholars, you will explore problems. You'll find solutions. And your work will be fueled by being part of a diverse community that includes people from all over the country, all over the globe, eager to learn from and teach each other. So, you know, I think it's such an exciting time to be in this place, not only because we can be here in person again. I'm confident that all of you will have amazing experiences at Brown, especially if you embrace the ideals of open inquiry and generosity that are central to our identity. So with that, it is my great pleasure to introduce today's keynote speaker, our new, and, our new chair and professor of Africana Studies, Nuliwe Rooks. And I am thrilled that Professor Rooks has joined us here at Brown. And I'm very grateful that she accepted my invitation to be keynote speaker even before experiencing a first semester here. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Professor Rooks comes to us from Cornell University she is a renowned scholar. Her work, which exemplifies the strength of collaborative research and scholarship, explores how race and gender impact and are impacted by popular culture, social history, and political life. She's worked extensively on issues including the cultural and racial implications of beauty, fashion, capitalism, and more, and is the author of several books, including her most recent, Cutting School, Privatization, Segregation, and the End of Public Education. In her current research, she's exploring relationships between capitalism, land, urban food politics, and cannabis legalization in the United States. And Professor Rooks has titled her address, Finding Joy in the Journey, Memory Lane, and the Battle to Remember. So please join me in welcoming Professor Rooks. Thank you. Looking for my talk, which they told me was here. It does not seem to be, but that's okay. I have an iPhone. Good afternoon. <laughs> How are you guys? Good afternoon. So I'm going to tell you, part of the tradition I come from has something called call and response. So when someone sends out a call uh, who, who is standing before you, a response is mightily appreciated. Also for teachers in the classroom, let me say. So I'm gonna try it one more time. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, hold on, I have to pull it up. It's gonna take a second. <laughs> so, good afternoon and thank you, President Paxson, for that lovely introduction and for the opportunity to speak here today. I really am pleased to see you all here in person. I want to say hello to my faculty and staff colleagues and a hearty job well done to all the faculty members, teachers, and friends. And oh, look how I just didn't look close enough. Okay. 
Uh, hello to my faculty and staff colleagues, and a hearty job well done to all the family members, teachers, and friends who are both here and online, and who cared and supported and loved you students during the journey that ultimately led you to this moment. I'm going to ask you to applaud their efforts on your behalf. As you all know, none of us achieve alone. And of course, to all incoming undergraduate, graduate, medical, and transfer students, I wanna add my personal welcome to all the welcomes you've already heard and will continue to hear in the coming days. In the English language, the meaning of the word welcome is cobbled together from Old English and Old French and Old Norse. Originally, in all those tongues, it was offered to a traveler to let them know that their journey had brought them to a place of arrival, to a destination where their presence was pleasing to and most desired by those already there. And so to you students beginning this phase of your educational journey, I welcome you in that general sense, but also in a more personal one as well. Because this is my first semester as a faculty member at Brown, my first months as a resident of Providence, and my first time in Rhode Island, for me, your presence and your journey here will always be bound up with mine. I understand the excitement and the dread, the sensation of starting a new adventure that can feel a little bit like free falling off the side of a cliff. I know what it means to hope that the welcome you've been offered is real as you seek to find and build new relationships. If we see much of each other after today or not, we together are about to embark on a once in a lifetime excursion that will take us in many different directions and once concluded will require as many different stories to fully tell the tale. But my point is that we are beginning a journey together We've arrived at this threshold, on the other side of which is an opportunity to join, curate, create, and create change in our community. To quote a writer named Octavia Butler, quote, all that you touch, you change. All that you change, changes you. The only lasting truth is change, end quote. I'm an interdisciplinary scholar who uses tools, which is another way of saying methods from a variety of disciplines to answer questions about the history and present of structural racism in relation to culture, society, and everyday life. I write about things like how we read, understand, or make sense of others when we meet them based not just on their skin color, but what we think their clothes, hair, or body size says about them. I also write about public education and how we in the United States learned how to not notice how racially and economically segregated it is. I research questions about colleges and universities and how they respond during times of racial upheaval. These scholarly and research interests lead me to ask questions about how an aspect of history, culture, or society comes into being, why it is valued, who passes it from one generation to another, why and how things are deemed important, how we show and prove what matters most to us. It's with that bit of context that I want to note that it says something special about Brown University, that it first offers us welcome, and then almost in its next institutional breath, asks those of us who are new to the place to read a document named Slavery and Justice, saying we should engage it as one of our first acts of sharing, learning, and community building. As you know from reading it, the Slavery and Justice Report is an extraordinary work. This is so because of the quality, depth, and breadth of the research and information it contains and presents. But also, and at the same time, the very fact of its existence is notable. This is a document rooted in truth-telling and the belief that the truth about history matters to us today 
It makes clear that genocide and racism and immorality and greed and a universe of crimes that offend humanity form the bedrock upon which rests this university, this state, this nation, these places that, for a time at least, we will all call home. One thing the Slavery and Justice Report makes me think more deeply about is how it might have come to be that the role of New England in general, and Rhode Island in particular, is in relation to the slave trade relatively muted in textbooks, in lectures, in movies, and TV shows about slavery in the United States. In most of those texts, when the subject is enslavement, the images and narratives and cultural histories we have we, we have overwhelmingly direct our gaze toward the southern regions of the nation. Just think about the fact that for those of you educated in the United States or whose previous schooling educated you about the United States, or if you've watched films or read novels about this country that focus on enslavement and intergenerational bondage, it's likely that slavery had a particular look and feel. It's likely that there were fields of cotton that there were sprawling plantations with grand houses for owners and small shacks for the enslaved who worked in the fields, and that there was a drawl or a cadence or patois that situated chattel slavery under a hot sun down south rather than the gray New England sky up north. In many of our cultural imaginaries, the south equals enslavement and the north equals freedom. Part of what the Slavery and Justice Report does is interrupt those willful omissions and misrepresentations and ask us, asks us to include Rhode Island in the story of how the United States became a slaveocracy, a country built on the condoned practice of enslavement. The report tells us that the story of enslavement is more widespread with more actors and benefactors than are generally acknowledged. It tells us of bankers who funded it and businessmen who insured the slave ships. It asks us to think about those who made the textiles for the, slave, for the sails that would catch the wind just so and speed the vessels in their human cargo along their way. It wants you to know that this tiniest state in the Union had global significance in that ignoble regard. It's full-throated about how Brown University benefited from it all. As you evaluate the report, you will make your own assessments. Challenge both the assumptions underlying the document and your own assumptions, and hopefully debate those points that you deem worthy of engaging. For me, the Slavery and Justice Report shows us how truth stitches memory to forgetting and both to a national project with long-standing consequences for who has the right to most fully narrate history. Because as a historian named Timothy Snyder has written, quote unquote, history instructs, for the rest of the time I have with you, I want to redirect our gaze from institutional, local, and regional history to our collective present, where there's a type of war going on that would make much of the information and research presented in the Slavery and Justice Report illegal to teach in K through 12 schools in roughly 20 states. I'm talking about the dozens of bills banning the teaching of what some have labeled as quote unquote divisive topics such as genocide, slavery, and racism. These bills are passing into law in states all over this country. The consequences for teaching much of the information contained in the Slavery and Justice Report are very high. Tennessee, for example, passed one of the most sweeping of such laws, prohibiting teachers from discussing racism or any social issues involving racism with their students. The law bans teaching about topics ranging from discrimination to racial bias to prohibiting a critique of the language in the founding documents of the United States or problematizing the statement found in them that, quote unquote, all men are created equal. 
If violated, the Education Commissioner can defund any public school and levy fines starting at $1 million and rising to $5 million each time their teacher is found to have talked about a prohibited subject in class. Though just past, though just past this past spring, already individual teachers have suffered consequences. One was fired for assigning an essay from a journalist named ta Coates, who wrote about systemic racism in housing in a popular magazine. Another teacher in the state was fired for having a Black Lives Matter flag fly in her classroom. In Oklahoma, educator, ed, educators can have their teaching licenses suspended or revoked. And schools can lose accreditation if an investigation finds that they taught about racism, past or present. Florida's State Board of Education passed similar restrictions aimed broadly against, quote unquote, teaching kids to hate their country. Arkansas's law prohibits teaching students that the land on which the United States sits and the economic engine of its growth involve genocide, cruelty, or slavery. Today, similar bills have either passed or are being considered in 18 states, including this one, Rhode Island. Of course, the United States is not alone in trying to control and sanitize how its history is told. In Europe, these types of bills and laws have been given a name. They're called memory laws. The most important example, according to the historian of fascism, who I mentioned earlier, Timothy Snyder, was passed in West Germany in 1985 and criminalized Holocaust denial. Other European countries followed that precedent and banned the denial of truth and the evasion of historical atrocities. However, if in Europe, the laws are enacted to call for more truth, more clarity, American memory laws, such as those I mentioned, forbid illumination. They call for shadows, darkness, and erasure. They would suppress or ban what Brown University has asked you to gauge and grapple with. Accordingly, for me, in this moment, this communal reading, this act, is a declaration of the principles on which Brown rests and for which you should be grateful. I know I am. As I so often do when searching for inspiration or in this instance, an ending for this short talk, I turn to the Pulitzer and Nobel Prize winning writer, Toni Morrison. This is from her speech, marking the occasion of her winning the Nobel Prize for Literature. Once upon a time, there was an old woman, blind, wise. In the version I know, the woman is the daughter of slaves, black, American, and lives alone in a small house outside of town. Her reputation for wisdom is without peer and without question. Among her people, she is both the law and its transgression. The honor she is paid and the awe in which she is held reach beyond her neighborhood to places far away, to the city where the intelligence of rural prophets is the source of much amusement. One day, the woman is visited by some young people who seem to be bent on disproving her clairvoyance and showing her up for the fraud they believe she is. Their plan is simple. They enter her house and ask the one question, the answer to which rides solely on her difference from them, a difference they regard as a profound disability, her blindness. They stand before her, and one of them says, oh, woman, I hold in my hand a bird. Tell me, is it living or is it dead? She does not answer and the question is repeated, is the bird I'm holding living or dead? Still she doesn't answer, she's blind. She cannot see her visitors, let alone, let alone what is in their hands. She does not know their color, gender, or homeland. She only knows their motive. The old woman's silence is so long, the young people have trouble holding their laughter. Finally, she speaks, and her voice is soft but stern. I don't know, she says. I don't know whether the bird you are holding is dead or alive, but what I do know is that it's in your hands. It's in your hands. 
What I want to say in closing is that truth, memory, and forgetting are first cousins. And so going forward, the frequency with which we revisit these cultural moments when some mandate that truth be crushed in silence for generations of school children is ultimately in your hands. As you move through the next few years, I hope you will take the opportunity that Brown offers you with its structure and classes and guiding principles and world-class faculty to center truth to think of yourselves as agents of change and find the courage to remember in the face of the easy seduction that is forgetting. Brown chose us, we chose Brown, and in all the best ways, Brown will change us and we will change Brown. It is with profound joy that I begin this journey with you. My hope for you is that you will always choose truth that you will root yourself in it, that you will know it and feel it and see it reflected in your own eyes as they gaze back at you from within life's mirror. I hope that you will remember it when you reflect on this moment and the document given to you as a first opportunity to think and engage in community at Brown University. Welcome. Thank you for listening. to ask you to join me in thanking Professor Brooks for an inspiring address, but I think you already did that, so thank you. My own personal thanks. Terrific. Uh, before we conclude our convocation, I've kind of avoided COVID. I have to say one thing. Last year, I was so proud of this community. Everybody did so well keeping our community safe. Now, one thing we like to say to students is get out of the brown bubble right? Go out, enjoy Providence, Rhode Island, go see it, have fun. And I still want you to do that, but we also have to protect the brown bubble. And by that, I mean keeping our students, our faculty and staff, their families, the people who live in the neighborhood around us, we all have to play a part in keeping them safe too. So I see a lot of you wearing masks. I see you some not, which is fine. Uh, but, but do the right thing. I know you will. Brown students always do. So thank you very much. And in conclusion, we have the alma mater from the higher keys. So stand up and sing it and give yourself one more round of applause. Welcome. Woo! Woo! know the words yet, but you will learn them. La, 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 la. <laughs> <laughs> Alma mater, we hail thee with loyal devotion and bring to thine altar our offerings of praise. Our hearts swell Joyful emotion as the name of old Brown in loud chorus we raise. The happiest moments of youth's fleeting hours we pass beneath the shade of these time honored walls and sorrows as transient as April's brief showers have clouded our life in Brunonia's halls. And thank you. Convocation has now concluded. Welcome, everybody. Have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. <laughs>